Hey, thanks for being a part of the conversation. Let's do some pod crashing. Episode number 234 is with Jennifer Romolini from the podcast Stift. Good morning. I'm great. Thank you. What an amazing podcast you've got because you're talking about something that we didn't ever talk about back in the 70s and 80s. It was one of those little hush hush underneath the mattress kind of stories. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, what was it like to unveil what you have? Because, I mean, this is going to create some conversation and it really does open up our eyes and our hearts to, you know what, guys, this thing that we're living now didn't start now. There was a beginning to this. Yeah. So, you know, so Viva Magazine comes out in 1973. It's published by Bob Guccione, who's this like sleazy pornographer who puts out Penthouse. And it's staffed by this group of scrappy feminist journalists at the beginning of the sexual revolution and the women's liberation movement. So it's a very interesting time in our history as a country and also the history of publishing. There had really never been anything like it before. It's a it had high aspirations of being a very, very quality editorial publication mm-hmm. that addressed women's desires and sexuality while also being a, a a place where you could see full frontal male nudes. You know, what's really interesting about this, Jennifer, is that, you know, um, as as that teenager in the 1970s, it wasn't the pictures that, that I went there for. It was the stories. So to hear that Viva was was all about the stories as well, that that inspires me in the way that, you know what, it, go go to where the imagination is planted. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these women, they just wanted, I mean, the price of admission was having to, you know, have their stories. And they told me Mm -hmm. this very overtly next to soft core porn. That wasn't what they wanted. What they wanted was just to be able to write. And they wanted to write about what they were experiencing in that moment in 1973. You know, it's, it's, it's this moment of liberation, but it's also really confusing. And there's a lot going on. There's a lot of gender role confusion and there's a lot of interplay between the sexes. And they wanted to capture all of that. You know, well, it's really interesting because, you know, I mean, you know, little boys are little boys. But now now you want to bring girls into this. It's like, oh, how dare you do that to our generation? But yet but yet, first of all, I, you know, kudos to uh, to to uh, the, the creator of Penthouse magazine, because you're right. With, with All they wanted to do was get their writing out there. That's what writers want. That's what we dream. We need that platform. That's why podcasting okay. is so huge today. You, you know, you would be writing right now, Jennifer, if, you, if there was no such thing as a podcast. That's right. That's right. That's right. I I agree. I agree. And I found so many parallels from then to today. Um, And part of it was this feeling of hopefulness, you know, Mm -hmm. and this feeling of I'm I want to I want to get my work out no matter what. And just like what you said, I mean, I've watched the publishing industry change so much in the years that I've been doing this, you know, 15 years. I started in magazines and you can't really get the kind of jobs that I had, you know, 15 years ago. And it is this interesting, you know, how do we survive as creative people? And I think that's something that's really uh, profound in the in the story is that these women were just like, I just want a job. Yep, <laughs> you know? yep, yep, yep. And they teamed up. That, that to me inspires my soul. They teamed up with a porn king. They went to an area that was totally really sp- supposed to be untouchable, but they made something work and it was right. And they were, they were super collaborative and you know, one of the editors said to me, you know, and all these women now are in their 70s and 80s for the most part. And, you know, I'm asking them to remember this time. And it was so interesting, like what they remembered and what they didn't. But one of the women said to me, you know, we had each other's backs. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, God, that's that's when work works the best, when it feels collaborative and creative and it, it feels like you're in something together. Can you imagine being in those early day meetings? I mean, my God, I mean, both of us as writers and as creative people, we've all had those moments in our life where where we're going to do something new. But but to be at this level of play where where it's going to affect the entire nation. I know. Well, I mean, I think that that that's something we don't have anymore that we used to have is, you know, monoculture, you know, magazines used to mean a lot. Mm -hmm. They used to sort of set the tone for the country in a lot of ways. You know, what was on the cover of Time magazine 50 years ago? set the conversation, set the the national conversation. It was important. We forget how important magazines used to be in terms of what we all thought and what we all talked about. So I, 
I can't imagine what it was like for them, but I also can't imagine because a lot of them were in their early 20s. You know, this is their first or second job and they're in these rooms with all of these pornographers and they're young women in New York in the 70s. I just love all the visuals of that, to be honest. And you know, if they if they were to still be, if this magazine was still doing its thing right now, what they would be talking about, women's rights. They would be all over it and CNN, Fox, everybody would be all over, you know, reading these and, and taking stories from these women who took chances on putting their word out there. That's absolutely true. And what's absolutely also true is that they'd be talking about, in some ways, sadly, they'd be talking about the same exact issues they were talking about 50 years ago. You know, it's they'd be talking about, you know, body autonomy and yeah. liberation and the things that, you know, they'd be they'd be talking about all the conflicts that are happening now that feel so similar to what the conflicts were and the challenges were in 1973. Is it possible, and, and this is just the artist on a canvas uh, uh, asking this question, I used to put paint on a canvas and then put my poetry next to the painting, and people would say, why do you do that? Well, so people can read the poetry. Now, do you think that they put the pictures in there to get people to read the words? I think that was the initial plan. And, you know, and also, let me just say, the magazine itself was beautifully designed. Yes. You know, Guccione was also an artist, and he, I mean, like, literally, he was a painter, and I think that he really enjoyed the design of Viva. I think he enjoyed getting to make this softer product for women that the things that he couldn't necessarily do in penthouse, you know? So I, I think that, I think it was a lot about the art and I think that it was supposed to be these, these, this erotica was supposed to be very alluring for women, but because it was both art directed and photographed by men, it was not what women wanted. It was almost a parody of what women wanted. It was it was it was kind of funny to be honest. So can can you imagine being in that room when Bob gave his stamp of approval to it? I mean, what was the yes factor in this where he he leaped on this and went with it? So I think that it was a it, it seems like it was a young woman's idea, a young woman who was working for Penthouse at the time. However, you know, there's some controversy around this because Bob Guccione famously hated Hugh Hefner. They were in a battle their entire professional lives, you know. And a few months before Viva came out, Playgirl had been released. Yep. And I think that whether a woman had brought this idea to Bob Guccione or not, he was going to do something like this because he needed to keep pace with Hugh Hefner. He needed to keep that war going. Mm. So doing the research, what did you physically learn from this? And you had to have been inspired by someone like a Betty Friedman. And, and, and because, I mean, I, mean, I mean, landing this job meant a lot to her. And for you to continue this story in a generation where erotica as well as porn is so readily available. I mean, I think there was a, an innocence and there was a lack of self-consciousness mm. because this was all so new. And it was interesting how even talking to these women today, how not jaded they are, you know, they they really had experienced something that felt very hopeful. And I don't think that that's what's happening in pornography today. Yeah. How, how did the marketing world react to something like this? Because, I mean, as that kid who would go to the convenience store and look behind the person that was at the counter to see what, what magazine was out there, how did they present this magazine? Because I don't remember seeing Viva behind that counter. Well, that was the big struggle, right? So they couldn't display it on newsstands where, you know, at this point where traditionally women, they couldn't put it next to good housekeeping at right. the checkout line, right. right? So they had to sequester it in two places where there were dirty magazines, you know, and I'm saying that in quotes. Um, and where these places where you found dirty magazines is mostly where men shopped. Women, women didn't shop in these places. So Viva really had a challenge from the start how do we get the word of this magazine out there? And I don't really think they ever solved that challenge, you know, so it had to be by subscriber. And how do you market something that nobody really wants marketed? Because nobody's thinking that women are going to pick up a porn magazine 
And, you know, nobody's thinking that, you know, a homemaker is going to want a magazine like this. So they couldn't find an audience. And yet Harlequin Romance, Jackie Collins, I mean, Fifty Shades of Grey. I mean, the, the, That's the, right. the proof has always been there. Why, why not, you know, allow women to be women? I, I could not agree more. I think that, you know, big advertisers did not see it the same way. They just didn't want any sort of hint of smut next to their mascara. Wow. And, you know, that's just, you know, that gets into all kinds of things about obscenity and how we think about obscenity and, you know, you know, cons- you know, conservative and being family friendly and how we think of, you know, how we've infantilized women and particularly did back then. So why were the critics so brutal? Because I don't remember the critics being brutal on Burt Reynolds when he was in Playgirl. I think the critics, so in the very beginning of the magazine, the critics were really brutal and they were really brutal specifically toward Bob Guccione. Mm -hmm. And this is because the first first several issues of the magazine were edited by him. He's on the masthead as editor in chief. It's he writes an editor's letter. These it, it. it is so off base. His tone for the first couple of issues is so off base. It's it's him talking about women in a way that women should not be talked about, you know, like their their children almost, mm-hmm. you know, and he it's very condescending. And I don't think he means it. I think he means it lovingly. I think he thinks he's doing the right thing, but he's not. And His idea is like such a joke. I mean, at one point he features like an eight page spread on erotic pocket watches. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking who, what woman is wearing an erotic pocket watch? You know, like he just, he's so off. So the critics are sort of merciless. And one of the critics is Nora Ephron. And she comes out with like this review of the magazine in New York magazine, just slamming him. And it's mostly that people didn't like Bob Guccione. So I think I think that was part of it. And so by the time the, the women, the, the female editors, the feminist editors and writers took over, it already, Viva Magazine already had this sort of stink on it because Bob had made such a mistake in the first couple of issues. Oh my God, you're, you're talking about, I mean, it's, it's so amazing when, when, you, when you share that story because all of a sudden my mind is going, okay, we accepted Hugh Hefner, we, we had problems with Bob, and then that led to, oh my God, what about this guy who's doing Hustler Magazine, which had nothing to do with women? I mean, there, there was such an openness there, but it was all, to my mother, it was all dirty stuff. But, but the thing is with, Bo- right. with, with, with Bob is, is that, you know, because he wasn't in touch with who his readers were, I have to ask you, Jennifer, the, who are your listeners for this podcast? Because I know guys are going to be listening, will they admit that they're listening to Stift? Will, will they say, hey, look, I learned something new. Man, I wish I would have respected it more when I was younger. I don't know the answer to that, but I I do know that we do have a lot of male listeners already. And yes. I think that the way the way in is, you know, people are fascinated with magazines, you know, and I think that this is a story about it's not about necessarily just feminism or the sexual revolution or the women's liberation movement, although it is about all of those things. It's a story about work and it's a story about, you know, a boss that is just off the mark. And I think that we all can relate to that. And I loved tracking that. You know, my career has been a lot in the last couple of years about writing about work and ambition. And I loved tracking both of those things. You know, the office culture is is really interesting. You know, you, you have these like these like they look exactly like you'd imagine a 70s feminist look like they, they look like a Gloria Steinem next to these guys who have literally <laughs> drilled a hole in their office window so they can blow in their office wall so they can blow marijuana smoke out the window. So these women were like in this. They were all together working together. These sleazy porn guys and these young feminist journalists like that's just an interesting setup. Let's just say that, you know. Oh, my God. I wish I could have walked into that environment because, I mean, even when I was with with a local radio terrestrial radio station we had a line that that if you cross this line you're in the world of radio we're going to say things and do things that will probably offend you but we're radio people i i i bet you there was such a line in in that business as well i i don't know if there was a line but there was at least an invisible line you know because they also had a lot of you know there were people who were selling all of the penthouse merch which is as filthy as you can imagine (laughs) so like And I loved hearing these women describe this stuff. I mean, and some of them, when I was asking them, so what was it like? What did you see? You know, 
they're in their seventies and eighties and they're blushing. And I, you know, I was like, okay, if you don't want to talk about it, you, we could slow down. We could slow down, you know, like, cause it's still kind of embarrassing to them. It's funny to me, but it was embarrassing to them. In reality, isn't this a piece of Americana? I think so. I think it's an important piece of Americana. And I think it's important for us to resurrect these things we've forgotten. Yes. And that was, I didn't want, I knew this magazine was special. I'd been collecting it for at least a decade. And I really wanted everybody to know about it because it was weird and wonderful and reflected us back at ourselves, you know, and really just captured this moment. And I think it's important for us to not forget. How did women react? Because I don't remember uh, anybody in in my circles or especially the girls that that would talk about these magazines. I mean, how did they how did they go to the store? How did they react when they had the magazine? And did they hide it underneath the mattress like guys did? I think they for sure hid it. Um, I think that. um, Well, I don't know if they hid it, because remember, born in the 70s was a very different thing than it is now. There was a time where. Porn movies were playing in mainstream theaters. Yeah, they there were. was it was something yeah. called porno chic. You know, people. Yeah. It was like a cool thing to. It was like a hip, cool, be sexy, be with it thing. So I don't know if they were hiding it, especially you know adult women. I, I think that a lot of women did love this magazine, but I think that it was it didn't really make sense as a magazine. So I think there were a lot of women who were literally reading it for the articles, yeah. you know, and were like, oh, okay, I don't need to look at all these, this this clumsy male nudity. Um, it, it never really found its audience for a number of reasons because it kept shifting direction because, because of Bob Guccione not really knowing what women wanted and not really listening to the women. It never really found it. And because they couldn't market it as well as they needed to because of the double standard, because you could market porn for men, but you couldn't market porn for women. What about Kathy Keaton? I mean, here's somebody that that stepped into that role and, and you know, needed to make a connection with readers. Did, did they I mean, if, if I remember right, these magazines also had where we could write to them and, and they, they would post what it is, what our personal views and questions and things like that. I mean, they, I mean, they tried to make some sort of connection with who their readers actually were. Oh, they published, they published, you are absolutely correct, remembering that correctly. They published pages and pages of reader letters. Yes. They did something called Forum, yep. where people would write in, you know, how they felt about the magazine, their fantasies, what they wanted to see in a magazine. They they had, they published a lot of advice columns. They had this incredible advice columnist named Dr. Judy Kuriansky, who was a big actual radio host in the, who went on to become a big radio host in the 80s. Um, I forget the name of her show was Love Lines or something like that. Um, But they tried to bring the readership in. And Kathy Keaton is this really compelling figure. She's the highest paid exotic dancer in highest paid stripper in Europe for a couple of years before she gets together with Bob Guccione. And she goes on to be one of the most successful publishing executives of all time from that background. It's he Bob Guccione saw something in Kathy Keaton and let her run his business. I mean, it's 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 pretty amazing. So let me ask you this question. We, we've talked about Bob in the way of that he didn't know who his readers were. He didn't understand how to how to publish a magazine like this. Okay, let me. Uh, when when you had the, the the women that were leading it through writing, did they know who the readers were, or were they were they doing like what most radio stations do? We don't know, but let's do some research. We'll find out. We'll locate it, and we'll keep making mistakes until we find that audience. I think it's the second. I think it's the second. But I think that, again, they were also young. It was only Guccione's second magazine. I don't think they had the infrastructure to really do that kind of research that maybe would have helped them. But I also don't think they they wanted to. I mean, I think there's something sort of wild and feral about this entire enterprise that that kind of is what makes it great, but ultimately is what made it fail. I'm so jealous of this because I love, I, my, my sickness was I liked getting with startup radio stations because we didn't know what we were doing. And so, yeah. so to hear this in this podcast, I mean, it, it just, I, I, I think that's why I'm drawn to it because we, in, in our own special way, everybody who listens has been in that moment where it was like, let's just do it. Let's just do it. That's right. That's right. That's right. You're, you're so right, Arrow. The, the thing is, 
a lot of the women who who worked for Bob Guccione or some of them went on to work at startups See. later on in their careers. And they said, you know, I learned everything about working at a startup from that I know from Bob Guccione because he ran a tight ship. We were lean. We were super creative. We didn't overthink things. He just went on gut instinct. So, yeah, there was so much that was so good about this. You know, I. I love an ambitious failure. And I think that's really what this was. <laughs> so then, the, you know, you know, people are going to go searching when, when they when they listen to Stift. I mean, they, they're going to go searching for this magazine. They're, they're going to go to a flea market. They're going to go somewhere because they're going to want to lay their hands on those pages because you can't get this on Kindle. And, and if it is a Kindle, it's a digital, a digital version of it. But they got to physically touch those glossy pages. Yes. Yes. I, I and, and I. I think people should. I encourage you to find this magazine. It is absolutely worth it. It is the strangest thing. And I worked in magazines for a decade. It is the strangest magazine I've ever come across. You know, So I really think people do need to see it for themselves. You know, there's just there's like one there's one photo spread that's just involves glitter. Yeah. Like I won't say anything more, but it's just a lot of naked people and glitter, you know, so it's just it's really just bizarre. And I think they all like when I talk to all of these editors about it today, they're like, it was really bizarre. And it, it they still have so much reverence and so much love for the work and for the place. I wonder how many men and women will listen to the podcast and then and then uh, and think, God, I wish I could have been a part of that photograph that was that, you know, with all that glitter, because, you know, in, in our in our deepest thoughts, we all wish that we could be on that page. Yeah. Yeah. To be the stars of our own show, the stars of our own desires, you know? Absolutely. Wow. Oh, Jennifer, I'm so proud of you for doing this. And I can't wait for when when you grow into the next podcast, because you you, you understand the process of journalism as well as storytelling. And I just know that that you're, you're going to have several different podcasts behind your name. Oh, my goodness. That is so nice. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That means a lot to me. Please come back to this show anytime. The door is always going to be open for you. I'd love that. I'd love that. Thank you. Well, you'd be brilliant today, okay? You too, Arrow.